There's no getting away with you know, having a point missing somewhere in here, having an asymptote somewhere in here. You must have a continuous function on the closed interval. Second, your function must be differentiable. On the open interval, a to b. So at every point inside this closed interval, you must be able to tell me the slope. The slope at the endpoints, we don't care about. That's not, if you can't tell me the slope at A, that's okay. If you can't tell me the slope at B, that's okay. okay. But you must be able to differentiate the function on the open interval. Okay? And three, the last requirement is sort of a strange one, perhaps. From A to B, our function can do anything it wants in between. Okay, from A to B, our function can, as long as it's continuous, as long as it's differentiable, we can tell the slope, it can do anything it wants from A to B. But the last requirement is that it starts at some height and ends at the exact same height. F of A is F of B. So in pictures, Rolle's theorem can be applied to any function that looks something like this. We pick some height. The last requirement says that at our starting point in the interval, we must have that height. And the ending height must be the same. That's requirement three. And then in between, we must be differentiable, which means no cusps. A cusp is something that looks like this. I'll draw it in red so that we know not to actually include it. A cusp is something like this, a sharp point. Okay. Sometimes they look a little different. Sometimes they look like that sort of thing. The reason we can't have cusps is because of this. A differentiable function cannot have cusps because if I ask you what is the derivative of this function at, say, this x value, that means the derivative at that point, you have to be able to give me a number which represents the slope at that point. And usually what you do is you find the derivative of a secant line or something that is, quote, tangent. And there's all sorts of tangent lines at that point. There's one. There's one. Those are tangent to the curve at that point. But there's all sorts of things in between as well. A cusp does not have a derivative value. It has many derivative values. Um, so no cusps, that's what this means. But it just needs to be continuous everywhere else. So a function can literally do anything so long as it doesn't come to a sharp point and starts at end at the same height. There, a good example. It goes down, it waves around a little bit, it comes way back up, it waves a little bit, and then goes back down to the original height. We can't have a sharp point in there. We can't have a jump in there. We can't have an asymptote anywhere in there. It has to look something like that. Now, if these are all of the things that we have set up, which is kind of a lot when you think about it. Starting at the same height as it ends, you can differentiate it, and it's continuous. That's like a long list. Right. Um, but if we have all of these things, Then, the conclusion of Rolle's theorem says that there is C inside our open interval A to B, where F prime at C is 
What would you guess? Hmm? Oh, no, 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 no. I was hoping because of recency, the last thing we talked about were critical values, and C is the first letter. I was hoping that maybe this would come out of someone right away. But that's okay. No judgments. That was an exercise in mind reading, not math. F prime of C is zero. If you think about it from pictures perspective, from the beginning to the end, we've got this horizontal line, right? Which has zero slope. Rolls theorem says if this is the situation where the average slope between the two endpoints is nothing, and you have a continuous function, and it's differentiable everywhere, then there's some point <coughs> in between A and B that is also flat in terms of its derivative. This actually has several. It's flat here. It's flat here. 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 Here, here, and here. Lots of them, actually. If you think about it, you know, the, it's sort of this riddle game. Can you put these two points and draw me a continuous curve without any cusps that doesn't have that problem? That it never flattens out? You could sit down with pencil and paper and try and construct such a curve and you'd never be able to find it because this is a fact. You might think about if you start by going up or start by going down, because you can't start by going over. If you start by going up or start by going down, eventually you have to come back down or you have to come back up. Which means at some point, so long as you don't have a cusp, a sharp point, there is either a maximum or a minimum value at which the derivative is zero, because that's a critical point. Yes? Uh, what about absolute x function? That has a cusp. The absolute value of x has a cusp. Very good. So as a non-example, graphically, this guy looks like this. What's its derivative right there? Doesn't have one. It has something called a subdifferential, sub, okay, which means there's a set of slopes that we can assign to that. And you can use subdifferentials to find out things about your function. Um, or you can use them for certain things in statistical analysis, etc. But it doesn't have a derivative there. So if we try to apply the mean value theorem, sorry, the Rolls theorem to this, we pick some height, we go over, we go over, we look, you know, it goes down for a while and then it comes back up, but there's no point where the derivative is zero because it has a cusp. And it's not differentiable everywhere in between the start and the end. All right, here's our starting point. Let's say number two, here's our ending point, say two. They both have the same height. It's definitely continuous from negative two to two, but it's not differentiable from two to negative, negative two to two, because it's not differentiable to zero. Okay. actually a proof, it's the word they use. Proof x cubed 
plus x minus 1 equals 0 has exactly one solution. Usually, students with pre-calculus get something like this, and then they immediately first start to factor, try to at least, given a polynomial, set it to zero. To find zeros, you factor, right? That's a good way of doing things, but there's a very limited number of polynomials you can factor quickly and easily. And as soon as you get out of the second degree polynomials, the number of them drops significantly. This is cubic which really throws a wrench into things. So first, do you remember this one? The intermediate value theorem. A little bit ago. Let's take this original thing that's on the left. And call that just our function. First, let's try and find some, some interval between which there is a zero. Okay, the intermediate value theorem says if we have a continuous function, which this is, on some interval, and this thing is negative at some point, and then it becomes positive at some point in the interval, then there must be a zero in between. Right, so we don't necessarily know what this graph looks like, but if it starts down here below the x-axis at some point here, and then it eventually ends up over here at some other point, because this is continuous, it has to cross the x-axis, which means there is a zero somewhere in between the left and right. So let's take first f of 0. What's the value of that? 0 plus 0, negative 1. Okay? And how about f of 1? 1 plus 1 minus 1. Great. So we certainly know that there is a real 0 in between 0 and Does that solve what we're trying to do? There's certainly one. Are we done? What's the problem state? State it says prove it has exactly one. How can we prove that this thing cannot possibly have another one? This is where Raleigh's theorem comes in. Okay? Raleigh's theorem says, hey, if we start and end at the same height, and we're continuous and differentiable in between, then there's something in between where the derivative has zero slope. 
if we suppose that we have two zeros, then we could use those zero heights as A and B. The inputs. If we suppose we have two zeros. There's definitely one between zero and one. So there's one. Let's suppose there's another input where the height is also zero. So we're going to let the zero in between here. Let the variable, or the number a, be the zero between zero and one. It certainly exists. Suppose there's another one. And we're going to actually come up with a contradiction. We've got a zero in here. We've got a zero somewhere else. So we're starting at and starting at the starting and ending at the same spot, same height. We have a polynomial. So between that zero and that zero, there's definitely continuity because we've got a polynomial. In between the two zero x locations, we definitely have differentiability because we're working with a polynomial here. This satisfies Rolle's theorem, as we've set it up so far. So let's apply Rolle's theorem. That means between A and B, there's another spot, C, where the derivative of our function is zero. So let's find the derivative. And it must be zero by Rolle's theorem. And specifically, the solution to this. somewhere else. But we can solve that, right? Right off the bat, what can you tell me about this function? Three x squared plus one. Forget the zero. How big is this function? What's the smallest value it'll take? This guy will never be smaller than one. Not with real numbers. The smallest real number that we use is zero here. If we plug in a positive, this just gets bigger. If we plug in a negative, this just gets bigger. So the smallest thing we plug in here is zero, and that gets us one. Will this ever equal zero? No. What's wrong? It satisfies Rolle's theorem. We're starting and stopping at zero. We're differentiable between A and B. We're continuous from A to B and at A and B. Rolle's theorem guarantees that between A and B here, there's going to be a zero book. There can't be. So we must have made some assumption that was wrong. What was the only assumption that we made? I mean, 
mean, B, this definitely is continuous. This definitely is differentiable, and it's if it has two zeros, then they have the same height of zero. The only assumption we made was that there were two zeros. We're guaranteed there's one by the intermediate value theorem, and we assume there might be another. And that gives us a contradiction, so there can't be another. backwards way of giving an example, I'd say. It also highlights a nice technique of proving something, which is pretty common, I'd say, in the world. And we always deal with uh, not having information, but we have to keep living. So we live based on uncertainty until we come up with some contradiction which informs us about what we should have thought in the first place. Hindsight, they say. So that's Rolle's theorem. It's really quite nice, actually. Geometrically, it makes a lot of sense. In application, quite powerful. And it's absolutely required for this next thing, which is called the mean value theorem. Um, the mean value theorem, maybe you've heard of this name, Lagrange, very famous old dead mathematician, very famous. If you haven't heard of him, here you go, Lagrange. Joseph. Louis Lagrange, also French, a lot of French mathematicians. Can any of you study history, by the way? History? 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 No one? Okay. You know who Napoleon is? Napoleon employed a lot of mathematicians. And a lot of the names that we see today are the mathematicians that he employed. Um, perhaps their work survived because he was, they were employed by him. There were other mathematicians that did not want to join his crew, and yet are still famous today. But they're not French. Um, anyway, another French mathematician we're working with his stuff today. So the mean value theorem, I can erase 4.2, but I'll leave it, has similar assumptions. And it's going to give a kind of a similar result. In fact, Rolle's theorem will look like a special case of the mean value theorem. So first, f needs to be continuous on a closed interval, just like before. Second, f is a function that is differentiable, same as before, on the open interval from a to b. We're going to relax, though, the third condition. So f at a does not need to equal f at b anymore. We don't start and end at the same height. We start at some height, we wiggle around, and we come to some other height. So this third condition is gone. If we have these two conditions met, 
Continuous on a closed interval. Differentiable on the open interval. Then, if 1 and 2, then f prime at some value c is equal to something for some c in a b. And what is it equal to? is it is equal to the average slope from A to B. So I wanted to have you come up with that. That's just an exercise. So you're somewhere on the x-axis. I don't know, here's our y-axis. Our function starts here, wiggles around, comes back to that spot. Maybe I'll make this a little smoother so it's not so cuspy. I always try to not cusp in front of my students. Um, what is the average slope from this point, A, F of A, B, F of B? I'll label points. Tell me the slope of that dotted line. As a formula, really. Fred says no. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. How do you compute slope? You take rise over run. Rise over run. How much does it go up? Here, here. These are two real numbers. How do you tell the distance between any two real numbers? Subtraction. subtraction. So pick one and subtract the other. Who cares about the sign? We'll do f of b minus f of a. That's the rise. What's the run? And here you need to be more careful. Yeah? b minus a is correct. You needed to be careful in the second situation because we chose B first here. We need to choose B first here as well. You know, Y1 minus Y2 divided by X1 minus X2. And that is the slope of this dotted green line. So the mean value theorem says so long as you have a differentiable function on a closed, I'm sorry, an open interval and a continuous function on the same interval but closed, and the derivative for some point in between A and B has the same slope, or it tells you the same slope, as the average slope between this point and that point. That is the average that they're talking about here. How many points in between A and B do we have here? Can you count them? How many? How many C's exist in between here where the slope is the same as the average? One point? Two points? Tell me when to stop. Five? Six? Seven? Do I need, do I need, did I need to stop earlier? Oh. <laughs> we'll, start, we'll start off. What? Okay, yeah, there's definitely one. At least one. That's guaranteed, right? Okay, good. Very good, very confident answer. What are we asking here? We're asking if I were to pick a point on this curve and draw the tangent line, right? Where on this curve is the tangent line 
parallel to the green line. So as I go here, you know, this is my tangent line, sort of tracing out the curve. Right about there, maybe? Okay, one. Keep going. Two. Okay, four, five, six. Six. Okay, at each and every single one of those places, Tangent line is exactly parallel. Whether or not this artist can replicate it. <coughs> point here, which means there. Point here, which means there. Point here, which means there. A point here, which means there. A point here, which means there. And a point here, which means there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six question, like English class back in high school, are these critical points? Critical point is a number that you plug in, which makes the derivative zero, zero or where the derivative doesn't exist. We, have, we don't have that situation here because it's differentiable everywhere in between. So, zero. Is the derivative zero here? Is the slope of this red line zero? No. Are the slopes of any of these red lines zero? No. Unless we're in Rolle's theorem situation. Rolle's theorem guarantees you critical points. If you have a continuous function that is differentiable, and starts and stops at the same height, Rolle's theorem guarantees you a critical point in between the start and end x values. Mean value theorem, not necessarily. Doesn't guarantee you a critical point. And the example is the dotted green line. What if that was my original function? Does it have a critical point in between a and b? No, because it doesn't have any critical points. It has no spot on it where it levels off, right? But the mean value theorem guarantees that there's a point in between A and B that has the same slope as the green line. And that's every single point, because it's a constant line. All the points from A to B have the same slope as the average slope in that case. That's the mean value theorem. We can spend the rest of our time working through examples. That's good. Now your book decides to prove this to you. I'm going to skip the proof. Can I erase this picture? Is that okay? X cubed minus X. We're going to apply the mean value theorem in here to, to find some points uh, in between a starting X and an ending X uh, so that we can find the same slope, the mean slope, using the derivative. Uh, your book suggests using the starting point of zero and the ending point of two. We don't need to be too wild and crazy with our start and end. So real quick, 
Let's compute the average slope. That's f of 2 minus f of 0 over 2 minus 0, which is okay. 2 cubed is 8, minus 2 is 6, minus 0 cubed minus 0, that's 0, divided by 2. The average slope between the starting and ending points, A and B, for this function, x cubed minus x, is 3. Now, we're asking the question, according to the mean value theorem, where is the derivative equal to that? So x cubed minus x differentiated equaling 3. So I'm going to do that derivative real fast. x cubed is 3x squared. x becomes 1. That's a quadratic. That's nice and neat. We set it equal to 3 because that's the average slope. That's guaranteed here by our mean value theorem because we're starting with a polynomial which is continuous everywhere. And because it's a polynomial, which means it's differentiable everywhere. So definitely from 0 to 2, all of these things are true. Mean value theorem says there's definitely a C in between 0 and 2 that makes this true. We just got to solve it. Just rewriting it slightly. Most of these problems turn into an algebra problem. What do you want to do next with this guy? It's up to you. This is the difference of squares, so we can factor it nicely, or we can use the quadratic formula. I think the difference of squares is more fun. Chelsea, yes? Why is it minus 3? It was plus 3 over here, oh. equals plus 3. I brought it over to the left through subtraction. No, no problem. I made the mistake when I first wrote it, too. I wrote a plus, erase it quickly, and then, yeah. I'm going to show you the difference of squares real quick. Square root of 3 squared is 3. Right? Every difference of squares factors nicely. Like so. Square root of 3x times square root of 3x is square root of 3x squared. Minus 2 times positive 2 is minus 2 squared, minus 2 root 3's of x, and plus 2 root 3's of x. Those cancel. We've got a product of two numbers, which is 0. And there's this really handy tool which says if you multiply two things together and you get 0, one or both of them is 0. So we set each factor equal to 0. We see x is either 2 over root 3 or x is negative 2 over root 3. Which one is between 0 and 2? Definitely the one on the left. That's the one the mean value theorem guarantees. Okay? It's just a coincidence that there's another point somewhere else predicted outside of 0 and 2 that has the same slope. Just a coincidence. Okay. 
Ready? The next one can I erase that example? Okay, the next example is uh, a little different. got some function, its derivative is less than or equal to 5 for any x. Okay, what this means is that our function is differentiable everywhere, and the value of it is definitely less than or equal to 5, no matter what. Differentiability implies continuity, which means that our function being differentiable everywhere is continuous everywhere. I said that quickly, that was a question that I asked last time or a time or two ago. What's the relationship between these two things? Differentiability and continuity. If you have a continuous function, do you have a differentiable function? Not necessarily, you saw the absolute value of x earlier. It's continuous, but it's not differentiable everywhere. So a continuous function is not necessarily differentiable. But if I give you a differentiable function everywhere, is it necessarily continuous everywhere? The answer is yes. Okay. So we definitely satisfy the mean value theorem from this problem set. The question is, how large can f at 2 B. It's no coincidence that Calculus is sometimes called analytical geometry. There's a geometry playing here. It's unfolding before our eyes. Not the function, but more like geometry on the plane. We know our function at zero is at some height. And it's not positive. Negative. Three. We want to know at two where on this dotted line our function's value can be. without using the mean value theorem at all. By how large, I mean how big, like up. How high up can it go? Purely geometrically, can you tell me? You're looking at the clue. The derivative of our function, which is unknown, can only be as positive as 5. Okay, now you're moving from x equals 0 to x equals 2. What if the derivative is always 5? That's a good question. If that's the case, how high up can we go? 
you move over two, right? Slope means rise over run in units. You've moved over two units, and if your derivative is constantly five, moving over two units gives you a rise of 10 in total. Right? Does that make sense? This tells you slope right here. Slope. We're asking how big our function can be. How high up can it be? So let's take the slope to be as positive as possible. Let's suppose our function, which we have no information about except for an initial starting point and some information about its slope. Let's suppose it's the worst case situation where the slope is as big as it can be by across this entire interval. So at 1, we've gone over one unit to the right. That's our run. And our rise must be 5 up in order to achieve that slope. 5 up and 3 is 2. So we're here. In fact, our function is definitely below that dotted line. Or it is the dotted line. Because I know the slope of our function can't be bigger than this. So it can only rise as fast as that line rises. So our function could look something like this at this point. But it's definitely not above that line. I move one unit further over, right? One more to the right, and I rise another five up, which puts me at seven. And that's the answer to the question. How big can it be? It can only be as big as seven. And that is the situation where our function is this slope for every x between here and there. But the reality is, it just can only have a slope smaller than that. So it could be anywhere below this, I'll draw it in green now, this green dotted line. So this is all okay space. My next follow-up question is, how small could it be? How small could f of 2 be, geometrically speaking? You don't even need to use mean value theorems or anything for this, just geometrically speaking. That's on. It can be as small as you want it to be. Because we only have an upper bound on our derivative. There's no lower bound. What if the slope is literally negative 10 billion, billion, billion? Then our function goes down really, really fast. That doesn't violate that inequality at all. And if 10 billion, billion, billion wasn't small enough, you could always make it a more negative number and go down further. But as it stands, there is an upper bound of 7 for f of 2, but there's no lower bound for f of 2. Where does the mean value theorem come into this? It better be a mean value theorem example, right? I mean, otherwise, this is just a waste of our geometric time. The mean value theorem says, we have continuous and differentiable, and I've already talked about how, because this is differentiable everywhere, we know we're continuous everywhere, so we definitely, between 0 and 2, satisfy this. Right? Between 0 and 2, we satisfy these two. Mean value theorem says that there must be some value c. In between 0 and 2, that has this slope, f at 2, which we don't know, minus f of 0, which we know, over 2 minus 0, which is 2.
Okay? We have a little bit of information about this derivative at C, where C is some value in between 0 and 2. We know for a fact that its value is less than or equal to 5. So red left to right, we have that 5 is less than or equal, greater than or equal to, excuse me, f of 2 plus 3. I am making a mistake here. Divided by two. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Definitely that. You know, that's that's when you like look at the answer and you're like, that can't be. That's impossible. We literally just worked it out. Thank you. Exactly. Dividing by 2 is the same as multiplying by 1. So literally red, left to right now, 5 is greater than, greater than or equal to 1 half of f of 2 plus 3. Multiplying both sides by 2 gives us our 10. Tracking 3 from both sides gives us our 7. instantaneous rates. This gives you a way of relating instantaneous rates to average rates without taking limits. It's all hidden behind that, right? Okay. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, plenty of time for the next two theorems. The next theorem says this. Let's suppose that we've got some information about a derivative. So the derivative of a function is 0 for all x's in some interval. I think it just needs to be open. So we can change that. And it's continuous on A to B. Then f of x is constant. Kind of an obvious result, I would say. Let's suppose that you know any inform you know information about the slope of a function, and you know between any two inputs, the derivative is zero. So everywhere in between here, you can differentiate your function, and the der derivative is zero. So there's no slope between there. That tells you that your function is constant on a to b, the interval a to b. Think about that in terms of the mean value theorem and the Rolle's theorem. And then that result would just pop right out at you. Because of that, theorems like this are sometimes just called corollaries. And here's the last little theorem. Suppose we've got two functions, f and g, 
and their derivatives are equal on some interval. Then, I'm going to write this. This is not part of the theorem, but just to give you an explanation as to why this is going to work. Then, we know this. The derivative of f minus the derivative of g is zero. And what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the derivative of something else is zero. Is that something else? F minus g? Because the derivative is linear. Across sums and differences, you can distribute it. And what does this mean? We have a function whose derivative is 0 on an open interval. The function is f minus g. That means f minus g is a constant on that interval, which means that f is the function g plus some constant. This is subtle, really subtle, but this is like the entire problem of calculus too. There's a relationship between derivatives of functions and constants, which you may or may not miss tons of points on because you forget to write that constant every time. <laughs> so, okay, that's it for today.